Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here this morning for our tutorial on recent advances in statistical methods and computational algorithms for single cell omics analysis. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, I wanted to mention that the, the break time, the coffee break, is at 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, and then it's, as far as questions go throughout the tutorial, we're going to have to save questions to the end of each uh, segment. But if, if you have a, a dire question, please come up to one of these microphone stands um, and then kind of wave so if you have a dire question, we can get to it right away. But otherwise, we'll have it at the end of, uh, of each section. Uh, just come to one of these microphone stands and we'll take questions one by one. So I'm Rhonda Bonker, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Biostatistics. And then we also have today uh, Yu Chao Zhang, and he's an uh, assistant professor at the University of North Carolina. And then Jingshu uh, Wang is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Chicago. So all the slides that we're presenting here today are available at GitHub. And so there's the link provided here. And then on that page, we've also provided additional tutorials and links to other resources that you can use. So the, the tutorial is focused on a high-level overview of advanced statistical uh, and computational methods for single-cell omics analysis. Uh, we're assuming that you guys have a general interest in uh, genomics, maybe a computational background, uh, and you're interested in the cutting edge of what's happening right now in single-cell. And again, we're, we're teaching these from a high-level perspective. Uh, so the schedule for today, uh, I think you guys have seen this, is we're going to start out with an overview of the technologies and some of the pre-processing steps for single-cell analysis. Uh, then we'll have data visualization, looking at UMAP and TISNI, uh, denoising and batch correction, uh, auto-encoder and transfer learning by uh, Jingshu. And then we'll have that coffee break at 11. And then following that, uh, I'll come back and talk about pseudotime reconstruction, uh, single-cell and immunology. And then Yu Chao will talk about single-cell attack seek and applications in uh, cancer. Does anyone have any, uh, if you guys have any broad questions about the schedule or anything, again, just please come to the microphone uh, if, you, if you have a question. Okay, so let's talk about why single cells. Uh, here I have this population here of some cats and dogs, and, and here's a duck. And if I were to do bulk RNA-seq on this population of, of animals, what I might end up getting is something like a cat dog. So I'm going to get an average of that population, and I might actually you know, miss something specific there because I'm taking an average over everything. Uh, with single-cell RNA-seq, we're able to, to get a finer grain uh, granularity of, of what's in our population. So we can do something like uh, categorizing the species or the types of cells, for example. So I have like the dogs here and the cats and then the duck. And then we also might have some information about where that uh, cell is in a transitory state, so maybe the, in terms of age. So I have the, the uh, kittens and the puppies here and then the older dogs over here. And so with single-cell RNA-seq, we're getting uh, more information from our data and from the underlying biology. So some major applications of single cell, there are many. Uh, the ones that we're going to focus on today are uh, cancer, so detecting rare tumor cells, studying uh, intertumor heterogeneity, uh, and dynamics of differentiating cancer stem cells. And then for immunology, looking at population composition of, of uh, immune cells across diseases or, or different states, and looking at uh, cell transitions and uh, different commitments. And so again, there's other uh, major applications looking at you know, development and, and so on, but these are the ones we're going to uh, have uh, dedicated sessions to. So let me talk a little bit about the features of single-cell RNA-seq. So what do we see in the data that's different from uh, other applications? So first we see this abundance of zeros. So here I'm plotting on the y-axis uh, for each gene, the number of, of zeros uh, in that gene. And I divided the genes here into 10 groups. So the first group here is the most lowly expressed genes. And this group on the right is the most highly expressed genes. And so you can see for those mo most highly expressed genes, both the bulk and the single cell data set have almost no zeros. And then for that lowly expressed group, uh, both bulk and single cell have many zeros. But as this, uh, the expression goes up, we would expect um, to have fewer and fewer zeros. But for single cell here in pink, we see that we still have a lot of uh, missing information or, or dropouts um, from sampling. And so we're going to have to deal with those zeros in our, in our statistical and computational algorithms. The next thing that we observe is increased variability. So here again, I have three bulk data sets in green, and now I have uh, three single cell data sets in pink, and I'm calculating the variance of the expression counts across all cells for each gene. And so here's just the distribution of uh, gene variances, and I'm calculating that variance with or without zeros for the single cell, just to show that that increased variability uh, is irregardless of the zeros that we have. So that's going to represent both biological and technical uh, variability in the data that we uh, have here. 
And then one of the third things that we observe is what we call heterogeneous expression distributions. So we, because we have those zeros, we do often see a mode at zero and a mode of non-zeros. But even among the non-zeros, here I'm plotting the number of, of uh, non-zero modes. And so we do see more genes that have a bimodal expression across cells. So that means that among the non-zeros, we might have a gene expressed at a high and a low level, kind of like a bimodal looking uh, distribution or e maybe even more modes. And we wouldn't be able to see that in a, a bulk population necessarily. Okay. So before I go into the different technologies and pre-processing, I like to give a broad overview of the different types of analyses that we do with single-cell RNA-seq to kind of get you uh, excited and motivated. Uh, so the first thing many people are interested in doing is uh, discovery of novel cell subpopulations. Uh, so here I've just taken uh, a single-cell RNA-seq data set. Each dot here is a cell, and I'm plotting the reduced dimension using like a PCA. And then I've done a clustering algorithm uh, and then colored each cell by the, the cluster it supposedly belongs to. And so here I have six different clusters, and you know, two of these major uh, groups here are pretty obvious, but then the clustering algorithm kind of separates out this red and, and blue, for example. Uh, and so we would like to know, um, you know what, what are those cell populations, and can we uh, define them and find uh, new subtypes that we didn't know existed. Uh, so the challenge here is that the unsupervised clustering uh, based on the transcriptome is challenging, due one to the large dimension. So we have uh, you know, 20,000 genes, or 10,000 depending on uh, how many are actually being expressed and, and captured. Uh, and then we have you know, thousands or tens of thousands of cells, or maybe even a million cells. Uh, we have noisy data. So again, we have that technological and, and biological variability in the data. And then we don't know the number of true clusters. So this is a, a, a generally challenging problem. And the way that we usually tackle this is to first kind of denoise the data set using some statistical method, uh, filter out those uh, no noisy genes or low variability genes, and then perform some type of dimension reduction like I just uh, showed, and then do a clustering on that reduced dimension. And then we can visualize the cells using uh, TISNI or UMAP, which uh, Jingxu will come back to and talk much more about. Um, and so some of the general methods that people have uh, used for this, so this is a list I'm providing of uh, software applications in R. So again, on that GitHub page, on that front page, I've actually, we've actually linked um, these methods to their papers and their software. So if you want to find out more information about each of them. Uh, so the general methods are hierarchical clustering and k-means, uh, graph-based methods, uh, semi-soft clustering. So a cell doesn't necessarily just belong to a single cluster, but it has a membership among uh, multiple clusters. And then a consensus, consensus clustering, where you might be uh, using many different types of clustering methods to determine uh, which clustered cells belong to. OK, and so again, we can do all this. We can do the clustering, and we can find out which uh, cell each cluster belongs to. But then there's a separate problem of identifying what type of, you know, what, what are these cells, right? So are they B cells or T cells? Um, so that's a separate problem that I'll come back to later on at the end of today, or of this tutorial. OK, so uh, the, the second problem people work on is, you know, we've clustered our cells, and you know, maybe we've identified what, generally what those clusters are. Uh, then we want to identify differentially expressed genes. So we've, we've seen this before with bulk data, where we just look at uh, differential expression between two different groups, looking at the, the change in means. Um, but here we might be interested in looking at highly or lowly variable genes, so maybe genes that uh, are pretty consistent across all clusters or are highly variable across clusters. And then we can also go beyond the means. So we can identify gene, uh, genes that have differential distributions. So if we're just looking at a differential mean, here's an example of what that might look like. So for a given gene, here's a, a blue cluster of cells and a red cluster of cells. And if we just think that they're difference in mean, we might be looking at uh, something like uh, this type of distribution. If we think that they have a difference in variability across two conditions, so maybe these are two different clusters again, um, you can see the red group has a lower variability than the, the blue group of cells. And so you'd say this gene is, is differentially variable across those two groups. And then also what's interesting is differential modes. So there might be a case where in one cluster, a gene just has a you know, kind of a normal unimodal distribution. And then in another cluster, maybe it has a bimodal distribution. And so again, that could get at some of the, the fine-grained uh, biology that we wouldn't be able to see uh, before. OK, and some of the methods uh, for doing this, if you're just interested in means, you can use some of those uh, tools for bulk, or there's also single cell specific methods that I've listed here. If you're interested in differential variability, uh, basics has the capability of, of looking at that. And then if you're looking at the difference in distribution, like that, those different uh, bimodalities or proportions, you can look at SCDD and uh, descend. OK, 
So then uh, the next type of major analysis that we're going to look at is pseudotime analysis. So this is more generally referred to as trajectory inference methods. Uh, I'll talk more about this later today. But we assume that gene expression varies along some underlying dynamic. And so maybe we're, we take some cells, some cells and they're responding to some external factor or stimuli. Um, or we, th it might be over space instead of time. So if you're thinking about embryonic development, how cells are moving along an embryo, for example. And so if we collect cells at a, just a given point in time, we assume that they're not all identical. And that if we had uh, introduced some external stimuli, that they might be moving at different rates. And so we want to try to uh, order them in a way that it relates to their, their speed of uh, re response. And so here I've just put an example where you know, we've ordered the cells. And so I'll talk about more about how we do this. But let's say we've given the cells some order now, which we call pseudotime. Then we want to know well, what genes are changing over that time that we've now defined. So we might plot each gene's expression as a function of pseudotime and look at what we call differentially dynamic genes. So we want to take advantage of that heterogeneity that we observe in the cells and see which, how, the, how different genes are changing uh, over that time. OK, so those are kind of a broad overview of analyses. There's many more types uh, that I haven't mentioned, but those are some of the most common ones that people are um, interested in. So now I'm going to talk about some key differences in the technologies. So how do we actually capture a single cell, for example? OK, so how do we capture a single cell? So the first way to do this was through plate-based in microwells. So here's a, just a 96-well plate, where each uh, cell here will sit in an individual well. And so you can use a flow cytometer to sort the cells um, into these locations. The commercialized version is called the Fluid MC1, and so they sort the wells um, using microfluidics into one of these uh, well individual chambers or wells here. And so each cell is going to have a physical location, uh, and it's going to be lower throughput though, because again, you're only going to be able to do 96 cells on a given plate. Um, but it's more flexible; you can take them out and take pictures of the cells and actually see the the visual quality inspection. For example, uh, you can interrupt more of the the steps in between, so you can manipulate. Uh, specific protocols. And so that was one of the first ways of, of uh, collecting single cells. Uh, the newer way to do this, which is much more high throughput, is to do droplets. So here we're flowing cells, um, again using microfluidics, but here we're flowing the cells into these droplets of water uh, where we hope to get not just the cell in the droplet, but also some uh, barcodes and reagents so we can actually get that information, the RNA from each cell. And so these uh, droplets here is an example. So some droplets will have nothing in them. Some will have just the cell, or some will just have only the, the bead of uh, reagents. And then once you get a successful capture, you'll have both the cell uh, and the reagents. And so if you, you know, put 20,000 cells in, you hope to capture uh, successfully this type of uh, event about 50% of the time. Uh, so while the capture is lower, it's much more high throughput. Can you imagine you can just flow the cells uh, quickly all into one set of, in a tube. There's no need to have a physical location. Um, and so the, and when you do this, you can get tens of thousands of cells in a given run. OK, so here's, again, the throughput for the plate-based. You're going to get hundreds, maybe thousands of cells. Droplet, you're going to get ten thousands to hundreds of thousands at a single point in time. So here's the kind of the history showing of, of the study publication date uh, versus the number of uh, cells in the study. And so we started with just one cell back in 2009. And since then, if we looked at 2019, this would be at a million cells. So there's already studies that have millions of cells in them. And you can see how this is continuing to grow. So a lot of the times, the methods I'm going to mention, some of these methods were going to be developed back in 2014, 2015. Uh, but now that we're in 2019, some of those methods don't necessarily work as well when you have millions of cells. Even some of those like clustering methods or, or reconstruction methods, you have to figure out how to use them when you have uh, so much data. OK, so some of the other protocol differences that are uh, really key here are whether they are full length or tag based. So if you do a full-length uh, protocol, you're going to actually capture the entire transcript uh, of the gene. And so this means you can look for isoforms or allele-specific expression. The tag-based methods, uh, they're only going to capture that most 3' prime or 5' prime end, so you won't necessarily get to identify isoforms uh, when you use these. But they do allow the use of what's called unique molecular identifiers. Um, and so these are actually a combination of cell and uh, transcript-specific barcodes that allow you to know the absolute count of that transcript. Uh, so if you have a PCR duplicate, for example, computationally, you'll know that it was actually the same, the same transcript, and you can actually reduce that count to just one. And so it reduces some bias that can happen during PCR. Uh, so the tag-based uh, is going to usually be those droplet-based methods that I just talked about. 
And they're going to require less sequencing just because you're, you're only capturing that three prime n, so there's less uh, things to sequence. And it's going to keep the cost a little bit lower. So it's going to be more cost effective to use those droplet-based methods because of their high throughput and the less sequencing overall per cell. So there's a number of different reviews of the technologies that are out there. I, I just included this one for reference, um, but they look at how many genes are being detected by some of these methods. So here's just a few of them uh, listed up here. And then also at the accuracy, so if you have you know, multiple cells, you know, how, how reliably is that gene going to be detected? And then looking at the amount of extra variability uh, that's present in the data. And so uh, overall, the, the droplet methods do detect less genes. So this is an average of about 5,000, whereas the, the full-length protocols typically detect about uh, eight to 10,000 genes. That's one of the, the major differences. Uh, some major considerations, so it's going to be more of the case that the biological application will lend themselves to different protocols. So if you're doing isoform analysis, you're going to want to have the full end transcript. Um, but if you're trying to identify new sub cell, cell types or cell clusters, you're going to want to have a large number of single cells. And so you're going to want to use a droplet-based method. Um, if you have a precious sample with just a small number of cells, again, just because of the droplet is only going to capture about 50% of what you put in, uh, you might want to do either more of a hand-based method or one of those plate-based methods so that you don't lose your, some of those important cells. Uh, additional considerations are the types of cells you're using. So, for example, brain cells, um, it's the, the protocol of, of just single-cell RNA-seq may not be the most optimal, so a lot of people are doing single nuclei-seq to, to get the highest quality of the uh, mRNA. And then the source and availability of the cells. So some methods prefer to have very fresh cells, and some are uh, okay with using frozen cells. And then the number of cells needed. So again, if you you know if you need you know a million cells to detect that really rare cell, uh, then you're going to want to use a droplet-based method. And then also cost limitations is something that we always have to to think about. Okay. So now I'm going to move into talking about pre-processing. And again, I'll take questions at the end. Uh, I'll leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, so once we have our reads uh, that we've uh, gotten from the sequencer, we always have to do QC on the, on the reads, as we've done for most sequencing technologies. This isn't any different for single cell. So looking at total reads uh, per sample, base quality scores, uh, GC content. Uh, then we do QC on alignment. Uh, and again, this is very similar to what we've done before. So looking at just total transcripts, uniquely mapping reads, or reads mapping to mitochondrial genes. Uh, and then we have to look at batch effects. So again, just because we're processing so many cells and having to sequence um, over multiple lanes or uh, flow cells, we're going to have to look to see if we have any uh, batch effects. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, one of the packages I like to use in R for looking at quality control on aligned reads is called Scatter. So it, for single cell, I think it, it's really easy. So a lot of these R packages are using like a, the single cell experiment package, which lets you kind of go from one package to another. So I highly recommend looking uh, into that. Uh, so first, the first thing you want to do is just to try to identify technical artifacts. Um, so assuming you've done your QC on your reads, now you can do your QC on your cells. So here for each, um, each cell here, I'm plotting the total counts, so the total number of reads for that cell on the x-axis. And on the y-axis here, I'm plotting the, um, the total number of, of features or number of genes detected. So here the average is about 8,000, or maybe eight to 10,000 genes detected. And then the actual total counts is anywhere from, this is probably 100,000 to about 3 million. And I'm using, again, this data set that had uh, six initial clusters. And so we just want to see, is there any type of effect that, uh, technical artifact that's popping out? So are these groups really different by their total reads? Or are they really different by the number of genes detected? And that might also tell us if we have a batch effect. Um, here I'm also plotting the, the total number of genes. So this x-axis is actually the same as the y-axis over here. And on the y-axis here I'm plotting the, the total number of counts or the percent of counts in the top 200 features. So for each cell I took the, the top 200 um, highest expressed genes, and then what proportion of, of those um, reads went to those genes. And so here we don't see a lot of separation between the different uh, batches. Um, but again, we're just going to want to look to see if we, we identify those technical artifacts in any obvious summaries of the data. Um, again, this is where we're looking a lot for batch effects. Um, we often do see that the total number of, of detected genes or reads might be different across batches. Um, but we have to make sure that the batch effects are not confounded with the, the biological question. So let me go back one. In this example, each of these uh, collections of single cells was done at a different hour, and it was also a batch. So here, batch and hour are actually confounded. And so if there was a, you know, a serious separation here, I wouldn't necessarily want to remove it because of the way that this experiment was done. 
And so we, when we're, you know, if you're planning the experiment as well, you want to make sure you try to avoid that. So try not to confound those two different things. Uh, okay, so before I talk about adjusting for batch effect, before we do that, we usually uh, normalize for sequencing depth. Um, and so in order to correct this, we want to, or we correct this in order to compare the expression of a gene across different cells. Uh, so again, when we do normalization, we're typically correcting for sequencing depth. Um, and the cells, we assume that they have different depths because of the differences in uh, sampling. And we think that if a cell was sequenced twice as much, we would observe twice as much expression for every gene on average. Okay, so how do we, how do we look at this in the data? So if we assume that there's a relationship between a gene's expression and the cell sequencing depth, here we have for each gene, the total number of uh, reads or counts observed for each sample. And then for each sample or each cell, we have the total, uh, what we call the sequencing depth, the total number of reads for that cell. And so we can plot each gene's expression as a function of the sequencing depth. So this x-axis here will always stay the same. So here I'm plotting the log sequencing depth of each uh, cell or sample. And on the y-axis here, I have the log expression for a given gene. So this is a single gene where I plotted the log expression. And you can see there is this linear relationship. So as cells were sequenced more, the expression of that gene did increase. And we call this the count depth relationship. So in, the, in unnormalized data, we would expect, again, to see this uh, proportional increase. And if we've normalized the data, we want to remove this relationship. So if we remove it, we would think the line would be flat. So then, uh, as a function of sequencing depth, there's no change in expression. And so we should have a slope near zero here. And so that would mean that we've done a successful normalization. Uh, so here's an example of some bulk data. Um, so here I'm plotting just the low, a moderate, and a highly expressed gene. And you can see that these lines are uh, parallel, meaning that these three genes have a similar, relation, uh, similar count depth relationship. And when I calculate this uh, slope, actually, I can use like a, a quantile regression or a linear regression, uh, and I do this over all genes in the data set, we get a lot of slopes near one. So again, that proportional increase, if I sequence twice as much, the gene will be twice as highly expressed, is holding for most of the genes in the data set, and so we're getting these slopes near one. Uh, we do see some slopes at zero, just because if you know, we're doing, where we have a very lowly expressed gene, there might be a lot of ties, and then across everything it's just one. But for the most part, we have all genes uh, have this increasing relationship. And so if we apply commonly used bulk normalization methods to this type of data, uh, we actually do see uh, effective normalization, so we get these slopes to be zero for these three specific genes, and then for all genes in the data set, we do see that uh, here we have a slopes near zero. And so if I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this, but again, I have my genes in these 10 different groups. So these are the most highly expressed genes in the dark red, or the bright red, and then the, the bright blue would be the most slowly expressed genes, just divided into 10 equally sized groups. And so these are the most highly expressed genes, and then here would be the most slowly expressed genes. And again, everything is kind of lining up right at zero when we've normalized bulk data. Um, so the majority of normalization approaches uh, that were developed are these global scale factor approaches. So you're dividing every gene uh, in the cell by a single scale factor. Um, and so this includes probably all of the ones you've heard of, so counts per million or, or uh, transcripts per million, or TMM, median ratio, upper quartile, for example. These are all just taking a single scale factor per, ce per cell and dividing uh, every gene by that value. And so if we look at single cell RNA-seq data, uh, and we look at the count depth relationship for different genes, so again, here's a lowly expressed gene, moderately, and highly expressed gene, we see that the highly expressed gene looks a lot like that bulk expression where it's increasing, but then the slope of this uh, moderately expressed gene and the lowly expressed gene are not quite the same, right? So these lines are no longer parallel. And when we calculate the slope over all genes in the data set, we see that those really uh, highly expressed genes are pretty close to one. But then as we move down to these more moderately expressed genes and lowly expressed genes, we see this shift. And so there's, there's some dependence on the expression level uh, with that count depth relationship that we observe. And so if we were to apply those uh, single scale factor approaches uh, here, what we actually end up seeing is that we don't normalize any of the genes very well. So what's actually happened is that highly expressed gene uh, still has a positive slope, and then now that lowly expressed gene now has a negative slope. And so we've essentially under and over normalized our genes. And if we look over all of the genes in the data set, we can see that it's centered kind of at zero, but no actual distribution is uh, exactly at zero. And so to, if we look across data sets, so that was just one that I was showing you. Here's a number of other single cell RNA-seq data sets that are publicly available. Um, we see that there's heterogeneity in how, um, how variable this is, right? So some are more variable than others, but we do see it across the board. 
And so we developed SDNorm as a way to normalize uh, single cell data to account for this. So the first step is to quantify each gene's relationship with sequencing depth, uh, cluster genes according to that. Uh, and we'll put them in some number of groups. So maybe we put them into four different groups. And then within each group, we'll estimate uh, group-specific scaling factors and normalize each group separately. And of course, we don't know for a given data set how many groups there should be. So if we say there's one group, then that means we're probably working with bulk data or assuming that all genes uh, have the same type of relationship. But with single cell data, we're going to need more than one group, so we'll probably have to do four or five. And so we'll evaluate the sufficiency of, of k number of groups uh, iteratively in this process. Uh, and so here's, again, that same single cell RNA-seq data set and bulk data set uh, using SC norms. So now you can see the lines here are parallel at zero, and these are also parallel at zero. So we're normalizing uh, both types of data effectively. And this is available in Bioconductor. Um, it's called SC norm. Uh, and then there are some other single cell normalization methods out there. Uh, so the SCRAN is another one. So it's, it's also a global scale factor method like those other ones, um, but it's very fast. So if, if, if you look at the data and, for example, it doesn't need you know, more than one group, this would be a much faster way to, to normalize. And then recently on BioArchive is SC transform. And so this is kind of similar in principle to SC norm where there's this grouping and different expression levels have a different count depth relationship, but it's specifically for UMI data. And it's also going to be uh, pretty fast. Uh, so normalization can help with batch effects. So again, if there's a batch effect related to sequencing depth, normalization might be able to help remove that. But if you have a different type of batch effect, it's not going to completely remove it. Um, so how do we remove those? So one simple way to do this is if you have the batch ID, for example, um, you can regress on that and then use the residuals uh, in further st uh, steps. Or you can estimate if you've used uh, what's called spike-ins. So some experiments, they'll add these external spike-ins, which are transcripts that are not biologically related to what you're studying. Uh, and then if you use those control genes, you can try to estimate the batch effects from those. And so those are simple, kind of simple ways if you have that data available. If you don't, um, there's these other methods. Uh, one is in Surratt, so it uses a canonical correlation analysis, and Yu Chao will talk more about that later on today, uh, the specifics of how it works. But essentially, here's kind of an overview, is that if you have data from, this is from two different treatments, but you could think of them as being also from two different batches. And if you just kind of plot the visualization of the of the cells, you can see that if you want to compare like this cells from here to cells over here, you don't really know what if they belong to the same cluster or if they're the same cell type. But if you do this alignment, then you can say, well, I want to comp compare the red and the blue of this cluster or the red and the blue of this cluster specifically. So it helps you align the data sets so that you can make sure that you're comparing the right types of cells. Uh, another method is this MNN correct. So it uses a mutual nearest neighbors approach. And it's also going to do a batch, uh, can do a batch effect correction similar to, to how this works. Um, okay, so I went really, kind of really fast because I wanted to get this all in, and I wanted to save time for questions. So if you guys have questions, please come to the, the microphone that we have set up. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, uh, I've got a question. So uh, what's the reason that uh, this uh, linear relationship between uh, sequencing death and observed expression level <clears throat> on the single cell level breaks down. Yes, yeah, so, the, so the initial reason, I mean, you can, if I, hopefully this will answer your question, the initial reason is if we, if we put uh, different cells on the sequencer in the same lane, just due to random sampling, uh, if a, you know, one cell might get sequenced you know, a million reads and then another cell might get sequenced two million reads, and so if we don't control for that, then just because it was sampled more times, it's going to have more expression for each gene. So it's just a, a sampling problem that we're trying to correct for. No, no, the, the, you have a difference between a low and high express set. Ah, I see, yeah, I see what your question is. So, so yeah. So yeah, you're, so you're, oh, you're saying why is this flat and this is, yeah, so one of the reasons for this might be is uh, for those lowly expressed genes, even though the cell is being uh, sampled more, that there isn't uh, more expression, or there isn't more of that gene to actually sample from. So just because the, the highly expressed genes are going to be so overly represented in our sample, and so we're going to tend to, to collect more of, of this gene than those other genes. So, and, and if that's true, you wouldn't necessarily want to impose this relationship either. So, so e I've had people ask whether that's a biological thing or a technical thing, but in either case, I think you, would, you wouldn't want to impose a, a new bias in your data. One question about the batch effect. Why correct for it and not include it in the model later where you test for differential expression? Oh, you, yeah, you, you can do that as well if you, if you know the batch. 
It, so if you, if you know batch ID, you can certainly, yes, do that. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. So question, um, if, if you want, need to estimate a slope, you need to have a fairly um, big amount of spread in the log sequencing depth. Yes. Is that not, not a problem? I mean, what, what if all the cells sort of are close enough? So my no argument escape? is that if everything has the same sequencing depth, then, then you don't need to normalize. I mean, not, you wouldn't need to normalize for but sequencing the, depth. The effect would still be there, but you don't see it. That's the problem now. Even if, it, even if it's sequenced in a small range? Yeah. So if it's sequenced in a, a really small range, then it is hard to, to calculate that. But I think, so I, I guess it means so how small. do you do small. any tricks? That my, my question was really more, do you do anything else, like subsampling? Also, would it help then in this case? I guess it also doesn't help. Then. Yeah, in that case, it wouldn't. You might try correlation, maybe correlation. Yeah. But yeah, I think if it's a really small range, then I, I don't think the effect would be estimable. Yeah, so I followed everything up until the last slide. Could you amplify a little bit more of what you're aligning on? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I didn't want to say too much just because you chose to come back, come back to how CCA works in the end. Um, but my brief explanation is that you're aligning the, the gene expression between two different, in this case, it's two different conditions, and so that you're able to compare the cells directly. He'll, he'll explain this in a lot more detail later on. If, I, if my explanation is too brief. Uh, sorry, I have another one. Yes. Uh, would, you, would you do imputation before or after normalization, for example? I would say you do imputation after. Uh, Jingxu might have a different answer, but I would say after normalization. The, the next yeah, so she'll, yeah, she'll clarify that. Oh, can you go to the microphone, please? Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hi. I, I see that there are three groups of uh, genes, highly expressed, middle, and low. And so you, you said that uh, the slopes are different, but I see that the variance is also different. Would it be possible to like group the cells with k-means not by slope, but also by variance, so we have uh, more information? Yeah, you could certainly, yeah, you could, you could do that. I mean, that could be an extension. Well, I, th I think in this slide, the variants are similar, but in a slide before, uh, the variants, uh, I think, still a little bit before. Yeah, the, yeah, the variants in the yes, here? Yes, this one, yes. Yeah. I think the variance is also important information besides the slope. Yes, yeah, so the, yeah, because the variation here is higher, it means that this, this estimate's also going to be more, yeah, it's going to be relying on that variability. The, the highly expressed genes are always going to have a lower uh, variability around that fitted line. So you could use the variability information to help determine the, maybe the clustering of, of genes and groups. Hi. Uh, when you talk about QC, uh, what type of metrics you use, and uh, when do you determine to fail a sample or not? Uh, so the QC is a lot of the, the same. I would look at like fast QC metrics, so looking at uh, overrepresented sequences, for example, to see if for contamination, looking at like the GC content distribution, um, the base quality scores, or the total reads per sample, uh, just for the reads. Yeah. But for specific cells, I would, um, I might, I didn't put this here, but I might look at mitochondrial reads. So, for example, if there's cells that have, you know, more than you know 50% of their reads are mitochondrial genes, I might exclude those. It's going to be a more um, data set specific thing because I've seen data sets where all cells have less than 20% mitochondrial reads, and then I've seen cases where a data set, almost all cells have you know, 40 to 50% mitochondrial reads. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of metrics to look at, but uh, I want to know how do you determine a sample is usable or not? Usable. In, in terms of uh, when do you determine uh, a sample could be failed? You can't use it, that sample for data analysis. Uh, so I would use some of those metrics, so looking at how many genes are detected total, or the total sequencing depth, right? So if, if the sequencing depth of most of your, or the total counts is, you know, above 100,000, but then there's a cell that has only 5,000 or 10,000 total counts, I would exclude that cell. Or I would exclude cell that, you know, it's kind of an outlier from the rest of the population. Yes. Brief question also on the technology. Uh, you mentioned the high loss rate on droplet methods. Where, how, how high is that? Do you have some estimates, typically? Which numbers are we looking at? And how is high is the what? Sorry. Well, how, how, what, how big is the loss? The loss? Uh, in terms of just like if you input 20,000 cells? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, if no, you, if, just, just frequency, the ratio. Yeah, about fifty percent. Fifty percent. Yeah. And is there any uh, is there any improvements inside? Is that something uh, people still I, I, I'm sure they're working on in, improving it. I know that I think t 10x has the, the highest capture rate for cells. Okay. Um, so some of those, the other, like the, the drop seek that you can build in your own lab, I think that's a higher um, or a lower rate of actually capturing cells into droplets with the, with the beads. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they're working on improving it. Okay. Hello. So can any of the normalization methods, for example, account for the true difference in mRNA expression, even though the same sequence in death, so that, for example, if a cell is quiescent, have truly less mRNA content and another cell is more uh, transcriptionally active, can be somehow accounted in the normalization? If you had spikins, um, because the thing is, you, don't, you wouldn't know whether that is due to a techni technical or biological effect. Um, so if you had spikins, you might be able to estimate what you think is technical versus being that, that biological difference. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we're going to transition over. Thank you guys for all of your questions. <laughs>